So first up, um, immunisation update, much needed, much um, appreciated that we've got some absolutely fantastic speakers tonight. Um, Professor Nicholas Wood, Ms Katrina Clark, Ms Ewan Lay and Ms Sarah Drew. So I would like to introduce all of the speakers um, shortly. But before we do begin, I would very much like to acknowledge the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people as the traditional owners of this country. We pay tribute to their physical and spiritual connection to land, waters and community. Enduring now as it has been throughout time, we pay respect to them, their culture and to elders past and present. So just a little bit of housekeeping before the introductions. Um, in the um, chat feature, there will be um, a place where you can go if you've got any technical issues with Zoom and a few of you have already chatted in there about not being able to hear. So hopefully that's all been resolved. Um, the speakers that are not speaking at the time, we'll all have our microphones on mute and if everybody could have theirs on mute, otherwise we get lots of feedback and lots of noise and we hear the dogs barking and the children crying and the kettle whistling and the champagne corks popping. So uh, best to have everything on mute. Um, please tap away, type lots and lots of questions into the chat box. We will be monitoring that throughout the course of the webinar. Um, if there's any big burning questions, I will probably interrupt the speakers and ask them to please um, hold off for a little second and answer a question or please repeat something if there's something that uh, somebody's not quite understood. So lots of questions is great. At the end, um, all of the questions that come through in the chat box, we will actually send on to uh, NCIRS, so the National Centre for Immunisation Research and Surveillance because that will help them also form their Q&A fact sheet that they would like to produce. At the end of the webinar, there is an evaluation form. It's in the, the form of a link that will come up on your screen as you leave the meeting. And certificates of attendance will be sent out electronically. So if any of you um, are perhaps sitting in the same room, but only one person actually registered for the webinar, that's fine, but please um, send either myself or Satmia an email to let us know who else was in the room so certificates of attendance can go to everybody. So without further ado, um, I would like to introduce our speakers tonight. Firstly, um, we will have Sarah Drew, who is the Education Management Manager at the Benchmark Group, which is based, well, she's based out of the Gold Coast, but Benchmark itself is based out of Melbourne. Sarah is a registered nurse and nurse immuniser and continues to practice clinically in both general practice and public health clinics. Prior to joining the Benchmark Group, Sarah held the position of Primary Health Program Manager at the Gold Coast PHN for 13 years. Associate Professor Nicholas Wood is a Staff Specialist General Paediatrician and Associate Professor and Sub-Dean Postgraduate Research in the Discipline of Child and Adolescent Health at the University of Sydney. He holds an NHMRC Career Development Fellowship. Ms Katrina Clark is the National Indigenous Immunisation Coordinator at the National Centre for Immunisation Research and Surveillance, or NCIRS, or NCIRS, however you'd like to abbreviate it, based in Sydney. Katrina's current role with NCIRS involves working with the National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Immunisation Network to promote communication between the National Immunisation Committee and stakeholders involved in providing immunisation services to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Ms Ewan Lay is the Medical Manager for Vaccines in Pfizer, Australia, New Zealand. In this role, she's responsible and accountable for the medical affairs function and scientific aspects of vaccines across Australia and New Zealand. Her role encompasses all current as well as pipeline vaccines. 
Ewan joined Pfizer Australia in 2010, starting in a role as Medical Information Associate. She then transitioned into Associate Medical Manager, roles in other business units within Pfizer Australia, then joined the Vaccines Business Unit as Medical Manager in 2014. She has since been in vaccines, um, or has been in vaccines since, and has helped to ensure effective vaccine recommendations and the inclusion of vaccines into national immunisation programs. She also developed and manages interactions and strategic partnerships with key stakeholders in Australia and New Zealand. Her passion is in enduring positive, ensuring positive health outcomes for people in Australia and New Zealand. So thank you very much. Um, and Sarah, thank you. And I'm just going to try and share my screen. That sounds great. Did that work? Um, it has. You just need to go to full screen, though. There we go. There we go. And so good evening, everyone. Um, just before I start, I too would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians upon the land of which we're meeting today and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. So. Um, Adelaide PHN has been very kind in giving us a couple of minutes just at the front here to talk about some of the work that we do in particular with them. Um, so we currently partner with both Adelaide and Country PHNs to deliver um, the nationally accredited course in immunisation practice. So just a little update on us. Um, like many people have, we have been working from home for the past 14 weeks during this lovely COVID lockdown. So hopefully if any of you have been reaching out um, for support, you've managed to choose the right number on our phones and get through um, to the most appropriate person. So during this time, we have um, moved a lot of our courses to be predominantly online learning. So where, uh, if you come to one of our sessions in the past, you will have come into the classroom we now have most of those programs, um, the theory component is online. And so when you come to the classroom now, it will generally be for half a day to complete your clinical components of the courses. In saying that too, we have um, introduced a virtual classroom through Zoom Education. And I must say the feedback from in particular nurses that are out there that are really busy having access to do um, their courses via um, a Zoom classroom has been really positive. So we're certainly looking at the opportunity to continue this into the future. Um, you can see there we have had significant uptake in the online programs. And I think that is because people are able to get the theory um, behind their practice first. And then, like I said, the time in the classroom is very much hands on. Uh, a number of new programs are about to come online. The first of those is the course in immunisation support in primary healthcare. So that, unlike the clinical program, is really targeted to the support services in general practice and primary health for immunisation. So uh, practice managers, admin staff, community health staff. So it's looking at the systems and processes that support our clinicians in performing immunisation. The next one that's coming uh, about to be released or was released up until COVID happened uh, is our wound management advanced practice. So um, a number of you may have done our foundations in wound management, which is the online component and this is the face-to-face -face classroom component. They are, however, unlike most of our other programs, only being delivered through the PHN networks. So you will have to enrol into those through um, the Adelaide PHN programs. And then, like a lot of businesses are now, we are planning our return to the classroom. I know a number of you have been calling in, asking when you're gonna get the opportunity to come and do your face-to-face -face component. We are very much being um, governed, like everyone, by both the federal and local health departments to make that happen, but certainly have our COVID safe plan. And we would hope all things going well, but by the 1st of October, we will start looking at that return um, in the classroom. So in order to help get you back into the classroom, Benchmark is offering um, a discount code up until the 31st of July for anyone that is on this webinar tonight. And that is across all of our programs there. 
So all you need to pop in um, when you register is that SA20 off and it will automatically give you a 20% discount um, on the course cost. That's it for me and thank you for the opportunity this evening. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, the Benchmark Group uh, certainly are an exceptionally supportive group. So any nurses out there that are wishing to do the immunisation course, it's nationally accredited, et cetera. So um, very supportive and um, certainly we support nurses through P the PHN here in Adelaide as well. So thank you very much, Sarah. Thank you. Nick. I'd like to invite you now to share your screen and um, begin your presentation as well. Thank you. Sorry, I'm just trying to get it to pop up. It was working before. Oh no, don't do this to me. Oh, there we go. Hopefully you can all see that. Um, so yeah, thanks to Angela um, and the team for um, asking us to present tonight and also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land and acknowledge the elders past, present and emerging. Um, so it's a busy time in the immunisation program and in about five or six days, they'll all come into effect. So. Um, the timing is pretty good for this. So what we'll tell you a little bit about is some of the changes that have occurred under the National Immunisation Program, a little bit of the evidence behind those and um, show you the resources that are available to support these changes. Uh, these slides we can make available to you as well so you can take them away because there is, promise me, a lot of information. Um, now, this is the schedules that will be um, sort of available on the web, um, the health.gov.au website. I think it's important to note that there is now a national immunisation program schedule for all Indigenous people and one for non-Indigenous. So, so that's a very useful thing and something that we've been asking for for many years and then Katrina might talk to that as well. So, so that's very good. Um, so these are some of the changes and they're meningococcal, pneumococcal predominantly as well as hepatitis A and HIB. And um, we'll run you through these. And as I say, there's a lot of information. So um, we'll do our best to try and um, go slowly. But as I, as I mentioned before, the slides will be available. Um, the main really um, driver for these changes is to make these vaccines more available for those that really need them. And those people that really need them might need them because of their advancing age, because of medical conditions or um, because of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander uh, people. So this is a, an overview of the um, uh, changes. It's a very busy slide. Um, it's something that you can digest later over dinner, um, but uh, we'll go through them in, in a bit more detail. Um, like all good changes, there is a, a lot of clinical advice available. Um, ATAGI has these um, fact sheets available. There are, as you can see, the six there that um, deal with the changes in detail, um, and there's a lot of information in those. So I certainly encourage you to have a look at those. Um, so starting with meningococcal vaccine, um, importantly in South Australia, uh, you guys, as you know, do have the state-funded program, and you you get the vaccines uh, between six to twelve, six weeks to twelve months of age again in, in year ten. Um, the meningococcal B vaccine is now NIP funded for all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children up to the age of two and for all of those that have specific health conditions. Okay. Um, important to note that there is a catch-up schedule which will be until the 30th of June um, 2023. Um, do have a look on your vaccine history, um, because particularly the air, because the vaccines may have been previously given in, in, the, in the air. The reason behind this is a slide um, which Chris Blythe um, showed in Clayton at a recent NCS seminar, um, is that there is definitely an increased risk of IMD, which stands for Invasive Meningococcal Disease, uh, with men B in the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander populations, um, and particularly in that very young group um, in the under 12 months of age. So, so they're a very important target group for the vaccines. 
how many doses you need really depends on the age at which you started the schedule and whether you have these underlying risk conditions. Um, this is a general sort of rule that the younger you start, the more doses you need compared to when you get older. So if you start the schedule between six weeks to five months and you have underlying at-risk conditions, the overall doses that you need is four, which is a three plus one. Um, if you started at six to five months, but you don't have any underlying conditions and you just need those three doses. And as you can see here, as you get older, um, you just need less doses. But in general, once you're over the age of 12 months, you still need two, two doses of the Bex Zero. Important to remember that prophylactic Panadol is, is useful and, and definitely should be given for those kids under the age of two. A uh, dose before and a couple of doses after the vaccine to stop these kids getting a very high fever. Okay. Um, in terms of the changes in the handbook, no real, re no real definite changes except to say that um, as you, it, it will continue the um, MNACWI funding at 12 months of age. Okay. Um, and the NIP now funds men B and men A C W Y if you've got these three medical conditions. That's problems with your spleen, um, problems with your complement, um, and if you're on this particular drug here, um, which is an anti complement antibody. So um, the men B NIP funding uh, program is, as we showed before, under the age of two. Okay. Um, the schedule for people with at-risk medical conditions, if they have invasive meningococcal disease, is pretty much the same schedule for men ACWY and for Bexero. Um, and it really depends on the, num uh, the time which you start. So if you've got this at-risk, just remember you have the plus one part of it, okay? So if you started at this age, you need four, which is the three plus one. Six to 11 months, you need three doses, the two plus one. And then once you're over 12 months, you need the two, the two doses. Um, there is a note here that with ongoing increased risk, so if you do have a, a no spleen, you are at, increased, at ongoing increased risk, then you should have booster doses of the men ACWY around about every five years. And I make a note here about the uh, needing for Panadol under the age of two for the men meningococcal B vaccine. Okay. Um, there's lots of information out there. I showed you the ATAGI fact sheets. If you go on to the Immunisation Handbook website, um, throw out the old uh, paper version. That's really, really well and truly out of date now. The place you should go to is online. Um, you'll see lots of information there about the um, meningococcal program. Okay. Um, so I think I might have mentioned, uh, here we go, South Australia has specific resources available for meningococcal B vaccine Oop. Um, and there are also um, NIP uh, meningococcal B vaccine consumer resources as shown here. We've got the web links for all of these so you can access them as well. So the take home messages, in South Australia you have your uh, state funded program. Um, offering the program of infant doses and to the year 10 kids. Um, from July 2020, um, the NIP uh, now funds the men B vaccine for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander kids under the age of two. And um, if you do have these specific health conditions which put you at increased risk of getting meningococcal, then the, it's funded for these, uh, these conditions for these two vaccines. Okay. Um, so that's a little bit on meningococcal. Um, charging along into hepatitis A and Hib, um, I'll just make some comments about those changes. Um, the key change now is uh, that, and this is relevant for Indigenous kids in the Northern Territory, Queensland, SA, where you guys are in Western Australia, is that we've moved, or the, the program has moved the 12 month dose of Hep A out to 18 months. And the second dose is now not given at 18 months, but is instead given at four years. And the main aim really to do this was to allow the meningococcal B vaccine program to come in. And, and I'll show you a bit later on why that is. Um, we know that um, this is safe to do because of the current epidemiology and the fact that two doses separated now by around about two and a half years is still okay because the vaccine does have fairly high efficacy and the antibody does um, persist. 
Um, it's important to check their Hep A vaccine history at the four age schedule, four year age um, schedule point. Um, so there's a few notes here. If you um, are 13 to less than 18 months and you're presenting for your 12 month catch up vaccine, just I would say just give the Hep A when they turn that 18 month mark. If you've already had the first dose um, and it was given at, I don't know, 12 months before, you don't need to give it again at 18 months. Just give that second dose at the age of four years or any time more than six months after dose one. Okay. Um, so this is uh, trying to put it together in a table form for you. You can see the disease or the vaccine um, in the first two columns and then the schedule point. So healthy Indigenous kids in those four states from the 1st of July at the age of 12 months, we'll receive uh, the pneumococcal 23, an MMR, a Nymenrix and a MEN B, and then the Hep A is moved out to 18 months, second dose here, and then at 18 months, they get an MMR, HIB and a DTP. Okay. Um, the other thing to comment now is a change on HIB. Um, HIB vaccine is particularly recommended a bit like meningococcal vaccines for those people that have problems with the spleen, uh, because if you don't have a spleen, then you can't um, really deal with encapsulated organisms like meningococcus, HIB and pneumococcus, uh, because the spleen is very important in getting rid of those bacteria. So that's why there's an increased risk. And so the, um, a single dose of the HIB vaccine is required if the person was not vaccinated in infancy or is incompletely vaccinated and when we show you some of the case studies you'll sort of hopefully make sense of that you don't need a booster dose however um, now it is recommended for the uh, those that have had stem cell transplants but not nip funded okay. um, so the key messages for the hep a and the hib um, really the movement of the Hep A dose from uh, 12 months out to 18 months and the dose two from 18 months out to four years. This allows us to give men B at the age of 12 months and the Hib vaccine is now funded for those that really don't have a functioning spleen. Okay? Um, and you don't need to give a booster dose if you just have that single dose. Okay. Again, like the meningococcal, and we'll show you in a minute with pneumococcal, there are lots of resources available on the Immunisation Handbook website. Um, have a look at those and, and you'll, you'll you know, get a bit clearer as well. Uh, in terms of pneumococcal vaccines, um, changes again. Then the main, really, the, the goal here was to try and make the, those that have increased risk, make it simpler for them to get the vaccines. Okay. Um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander in the NT, Queensland, SA and WA are, are, are a group. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander adults, um, all over the age of 50 are a target group, and all non-Indigenous. So, so these really are the changes that the government has tried to make it simpler to get vaccines into these, these age groups and these um, particular people with risk groups. Um, you may remember we had this horrible problem of category A and category B conditions. Um, fortunately, we've got rid of that now and there's just a single list. Um, category, it did my head in trying to understand cat, cat A versus cat B, um, which is good. There's now just a single list which applies to this um, conditions uh, risk. And here's the list here. It's much simpler. Um, we, we, took on board the notion, like I said before, that the categories were too complex and um, it made sense to have one list and this was supported by the literature as well. Okay. So this is a bit more um, detail and we'll go through each of these um, one by one. Um, but importantly, if you get children over the age of 12 months um, or adults or adolescents who have a risk condition, they're supposed to get this 13 violent pneumococcal conjugate vaccine at diagnosis and a 23 violent pneumococcal vaccine later on. If they've previously had doses of that, then you don't need to repeat, repeat the dosing, okay? Um, but if it's not documented, um, it's not given, therefore you should give it. But I'll go through that in a bit more detail. Um, okay, so for the healthy non-Indigenous kids, uh, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children living in the ACT, New South Wales, Tasmania and Victoria. It's pretty simple. It's just three doses at two months, four months and 12 months. 
However, you can start the two month dose at the age of six weeks. So that's what we're doing already. So that's not any change. That's pretty, uh, pretty simple. Three doses, two, four and 12 months. Okay. For the at-risk kids under the age of 12 months, or for the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children in those four states, then they get an extra dose. And that's really the dose at six months. So they get a two, four, six and a 12 month dose. Then they get a Numavax 23, four years later, at the age of four years, and then one other secondary dose about five years after that. So if an Aboriginal kid in South Australia is born um, on July the 2nd, this is the, this is the schedule that you will be following. Two, four, six, and 12, plus the Numavax at four, and then one at five years after that. Okay, so that's, that's that story. Um, if you are over the age of 12 months, um, or you're an adult, adolescent with a risk condition, so these are just basically, you know, that we had that list before that we showed you. What you do there is you get a single dose of Prevnar 13 at the diagnosis, and then you again get two doses of Numavax 23. One, at least 12 months after that, 13 valent conjugate vaccine or at age four years. So, so for example, a two year old turns up in the clinic and they've been diagnosed with nephrotic syndrome, okay? They're at, in the at risk group, they should get a single dose of the 13 valent. And then when they turn um, at least 12 months later, um, or probably in this age, at the age of four, they'd get their first dose of the 23 valent pneumococcus, and then another one five years later after that. Okay. Um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander adults who don't have a risk condition, what they do at the age of 50 years, they get their first uh, 13 valent pneumococcal conjugate vaccine, and then again, two more doses. So you can sort of see there's a bit of pattern here. What we like to do is give you the 13 valent dose, follow that up with two lots of the 23 valent um, pneumovax vaccine, at least um, five years um, interval between them. Um, so that's the sort of, uh, for the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island adults without a risk condition, okay? For non-Indigenous adults who don't have a risk condition, they get a single dose of the 13 valent conjugate vaccine, and this is a bit of a change, at 70 years. In the past, this particular group was recommended to get the 23 valent vaccine at 65. That's no longer given. They have to wait until they are 70 and they get a um, 13 valent dose. Okay. Um, this aligns with the schedule point at the age of 70 years um, for the Zoster vaccine. Okay. Um, all these things are outlined quite nicely in the Atagi statements. Um, and that table is quite hopefully easy to follow. Okay. So in terms of the pneumococcal vaccine for children, the key messages are for the healthy kids in all states and territories, uh, two, four, 12 months. For the Aboriginal uh, Torres Strait Islander children in WA, NT, SA, Queensland, they get uh, two, four, six, 12, and then these two 23 valents and the kids that have the medical risk conditions, they get this extra dosing as well. Important to look on the air to get their um, vaccine history because we really only like to give two doses of the 23 valent vaccine. Um, when an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander person turns 50, they're recommended to get their 13 valent dose. And then again, the two doses of the 23 valent. Now the healthy non-Indigenous people uh, wait till 70 when they get their um, 13 valent um, conjugate vaccine. Like I said before, have a look on the air to, and hopefully the, the previous doses will be um, registered there. There are some online tools that are um, under, under development. There's the National Immunisation Catch-Up Calculator, um, which you can have a look at. There's requests for feedback about that. It's focused only on the under 10s. Um, the NUMA Smart tool is being updated, and I'm not sure if Angela wants to say anything about that one, um, but she, she might want to later on. Um, so um, I'll just give you some clinical case examples. This is an Aboriginal child aged 12 months, uh, turns up after the 1st of July, um, in living in South Australia, had all the NIP vaccines up to date, including the 
South Australian Vaxero doses, but not yet had a flu vaccine. So the plan would be this, at 12 months, this kid gets five doses, they get their Prevnar, they get their MMR, their Nymenrix, they get the Bexero, um, they get their first dose of the flu shot, and then because it's the first year they're getting the flu, they're recommended a second dose. Uh, then they go out to 18 months, they get a Hep A, an MMR, a Hib and a DTP. They get another flu shot shown over here. Um, and then I think I can't quite see it because of the screen in the way, but you can also see here, they get a uh, Numavax at four, another second dose of Hep A at four, and a DTP at four. Okay, so that's uh, an example for you. Um, uh, this is a um, older, healthy, non-Indigenous adult who turns up, 65-year-old, um, um, non-smoker, rarely drinks alcohol, um, had a DTPA about three years ago, but have not yet had a flu vaccine. Well, they don't get this Numavax 23. They have to wait till they're 70 and they get the Prevnar 13. They get a Zostavax when they're 70, but right now they can get their flu shot and then they have another dose every year until they turn um, 70, okay? Uh, so that's that one. All these doses are funded. Um, a non-Indigenous adult who has a medical condition, this is uh, living in South Australia, um, unfortunately had an emergency splenectomy about three weeks ago. Um, had a tetanus vaccine at the hospital ED, but no past history of Hib vaccine or meningococcal vaccine, um, and had two documented doses of MMR, but no flu vaccine. So for them, what we would do is get that Prevnar, Nymenrix, Bexero, and Hib in. We really want to cover them for the encapsulated organisms. That's the meningococcal, the pneumococcal, and the haemophilus. They're the nasty ones if you don't have a spleen. So they're the key ones to get in and a flu shot, okay? So that's what you can do right now. You then follow it up with a second uh, dose of the Nymenrix and the Bexero, okay? And then you get this Numavax 23 given at least um, an interval of a year, um, although it could be a little bit earlier, but I reckon about a year is useful to give the second dose of Numavax here. Um, continuing on with their annual flu shot as shown, um, they get an, a booster dose of Nymenrix at the five year mark, another one at five years later while they've got ongoing, whoops, what's happened? Um, while they get ongoing, um, uh, ongoing risk of disease because they haven't got a spleen anymore, okay. Um, all right, so that's an example there for you. Um, some FAQs that we've got. Um, can Bexera be co-administered with other uh, vaccines? Yes, it can be. Um, although both Bexero and Prevnar 13 can cause a high frequency of injection site reaction. So we recommend that you don't really give them if you can avoid it in the same limb and try and get two and a half centimetre distance between if you do have to give it in the same limb. And as you know, we like to give uh, the, once they turn 12 in the upper limb. Okay. Um, so that's that point. Um, when someone says to you, well, why do I have to wait now for another five years to get that pneumococcal vaccine when my friend who's 65 turned before me has had the 23 valent? Um, the answer to that you can say is, well, among Australian adults, the, particularly the bacteremic um, risk is much higher. Oops, let's keep, let's keep going faster. Is much high, um, higher um, from the age of 70 compared to 60 to 60, 65 to 69. Okay, so so we, what we're a bit worried about was the waning immunity. So we really want to get a um, a good conjugate style vaccine in when they really need it, and that's from 70 years and, and older. Okay, um, I talked a little bit about the waning immunity. Um, and, and if we get that dose in when they get to 70, we'll hopefully um, try and stop the pneumonia that we can see in that age group, okay? Um, that I've just mentioned that there, that the 13 valent vaccine is pretty good protection for uh, the pneumococcal pneumonia that we see. Um, the 13 valent covers most of them. So, so, the, so when they say, why do I have to wait another five years? You say, well, that's the best thing to do because when you get to 70, you get a free 13 valent dose 
It's um, going to give you good protection against the types of pneumococcus that can cause pneumonia, and the high risk is beyond the age of 70. Okay. Um, so um, my patient, this is another question. My patient who has a risk condition for uh, pneumococcal disease has previously had um, two doses of the uh, 23 valent pneumococcal conjugate vaccine. What further doses should they get? Um, and what the current recommendation would just be a single uh, one dose of the 13 valent um, uh, conjugate vaccine. Okay. Um, we make a note here that you can try and check the register. Um, if, they have, if they've already had a 13 valent, then they're probably okay. okay. Um, an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander kid has had four doses of the 13 valent conjugate vaccine and one dose of the 23 valent, and then got the medical condition at five years. What does this child then receive? These are the sorts of scenarios that can happen. Well, they've pretty much done their bit with their conjugate vaccine. So they would, could, should get another, uh, the second dose of the 23 valent one, at least five years after the previous one. Um, uh, you need to check that uh, the schedule and look for previous doses as well. Um, there's just some sort of caveats there that we've, we've mentioned for you. No. We like really to get the two doses of the 23 valent pneumococcal polysaccharide in. So some final take home messages, um, try to, and Chris, Katrina will talk more about this, um, particularly identify the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in your practice and their need for additional vaccines. Um, try and find the at-risk patients in, in your practice and their needs. Um, have a look at the schedule changes. We've given you a lot of information and places to go to. Um, look on the NIP, uh, look at the SA schedule. You're already doing that about recording on the register and making sure you've got the latest version of the practice software. Um, lots of infographics now on the handbook. So as I mentioned, throw out the um, paper version. It's probably not even strong enough or thick enough to doorstop um, and go to these online ones because they really are the, the useful um, um, infographics that you can, and there's a list of um, additional resources there. So I might um, stop there, Angela, and, and let you either um, Katrina talk and, and then we can take questions later. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Nick. That was a great overview of um, lots of changes to the schedule. And uh, like you alluded, this is the soft launch. Um, none of the vaccines are tied in with no page type so um, if you forget to give a vaccine that's now recommended or something like that, um, it's not going to be a big um, The one thing I'll just make a really quick comment on, um, just for the guys to remember the difference between what's recommended uh, as a schedule versus what's on the catch-up. So when you get, uh, you know, children above 12 months, they are diagnosed with a medical condition, get a dose of pregnant up, or a dose of unit 43. If they haven't had all of their primary courses as a young infant, they uh, should be a catch-up. So catch children up with missing doses, missing doses, up until they're five years of age. So you've got a special catch-up table around that. So um, catch-up is different to just what a standard schedule is as well. So, um, so thank you very much, Nick, and uh, welcome to Trina. Thank you. Sorry, I always forget to unmute myself. <laughs> so thanks for that lovely introduction, Angela, as well at the start of the um, night. Um, so as Angela said, my name is Katrina and I'm a proud uh, Barkindji woman from far western New South Wales. And I just like to acknowledge and pay my respects to our ancestors, our elders, uh, past and present for their strength, their resilience and their wisdom. And also um, to my fellow um, non-Indigenous uh, co-workers online tonight as well that you know um, 
also walk with us to continue to support um, the best possible outcome for all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples um, throughout Australia. So tonight I'll just be uh, providing a, an overview on existing opportunities for improvement and highlighting the inequalities in disease burden and vaccination coverage for um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities, as well as addressing, um, as, as well as discussing and addressing the rationale behind the current immunisation schedule for the at-risk uh, groups, as well as explaining, yeah, as I just said, the rationale behind the upcoming schedules as well. Changes that Nick's already uh, spoken about. So I'm going to also show you quite a few, oh, sorry, a few graphs tonight. So a lot of those graphs as well and the burden of diseases will be coming from these two reports that uh, were published late last year in 2019 from NC. Now we do still have uh, a few of the uh, vaccination for our mob hard copy reports. So if anybody online tonight would like any hard copies of those reports, if you just wanted to give us an email at uh, NC, we can send those out to you. Sorry. Um, so it, historically immunisation has been and remains a simple, timely and effective and affordable way to improve Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health, delivering positive outcomes for people of all ages. However, Aboriginal, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children, we still experience higher rates of vaccine preventable diseases compared to non-Indigenous children. So during this presentation, I hope to answer a few questions to why the NIP schedule is different for my mob by giving examples of vaccine preventable diseases, a disease burden disparities, as well as highlighting the NIP uh, gaps. This graph shows the rates of invasive pneumococcal disease notification by age in Indigenous status in Australia between 2006 to 2000. And 15. The burden of IPD disease remains high in Aboriginal people despite long standing vaccination programs. As you can see by the solid blue line, it's three times higher and less than our five year old children. And then, as you can see by the red line, it's 10 times higher in our five to 49 year olds. And six times higher, and then we have our uh, green line then at six times higher in our 50, 50 year olds. That's compared to non-Indigenous children. Sorry, non-Indigenous people. So the recommendations for pneumococcal vaccine, so as Nick uh, mentioned, they are changing for um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, as well as um, adults with those uh, medical risk factors. So these will explain, so as Nick mentioned, he explained those yeah, in depth. Sorry, I've lost the word. <laughs> and then my next slide. So this is um, meningococcal disease notification rates by all ages in Australia by serotypes indigenous status uh, from 2006 to 2015. So meningococcal disease, it's rare, but it's a really serious infection. I know this graph, as you can see by the red line in meninge C, disease notifications have almost disappeared since the commencement of meningococcal C vaccination program in 2003. However, meningococcal B uh, disease rates still remain several times higher amongst our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people than other um, Australians. Yep. Subsequently, uh, the period covered in this graph, meningococcal W and Y strains have also emerged as a cause of disease with much higher rates in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Meningococcal ACWY was added to the NIP in 2018 for all children aged 12 months of age and also for adolescents 15 to 19 years of age. However, should we also be giving the additional meningococcal meninge ACWY to Aboriginal children aged 
14, sorry, five to 14, given I've just shown you the gap in our, you know, our rates is like one to four times higher, sorry, four times higher. Sorry, I'm just going This is the recent data of meningococcal um, B notification by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people compared to non-Aboriginal people by all age groups. As you can see, the disease is more common in children less than 12 months of age. It's six times higher in less than six times higher in our 12 months compared to our non-Indigenous children, and two times higher in our 12 to 23 months compared to the non-Indigenous children. So that's the blue lines on the bar graph. And then it's 11 times higher compared to the non-Indigenous children as well in our two to four year olds and seven times higher in our 10 to 14 year olds. You know, this is, this is the good news that meningococcal B vaccine is coming on the schedule from July 1 in a couple of days. You know, so this data really drives the decision to include the meningococcal B nationally, although you know, South Australia has already had it on their schedule now for a couple of years. So we're hoping you know, this data as well tonight um, really drives that discussion around when you're having that discussion with, um, with the non-Indigenous uh, parents you know, to why that the vaccine is actually only on the schedule at the NIP for Aboriginal children is, is because our disease disparity in our, you know, most vulnerable is so high as this graph has just shown. Now, here's a, you know, a, a really great example as well of a targeted program of, um, for example, you know, th this graph prior to the introduction of hepatitis a vaccination program in 2005, the rate of hep hepatitis A disease was five times higher for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. You know, following this introduction, you can see the sharp decline in 2007. In 2007. Now that's for the um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children in the jurisdictions uh, in Western Australia, South Australia, and Northern Territory and Queensland. So that's they were the four um, jurisdictions with the highest highest rates. So following from July one, so these are the from July one, those states and territories, the funding for Hep A vaccine with the new schedule point. So that will be, as Nick explained as well, is at 18 and four years of age. So that was the so the schedule point changed to four years of age. So that was changing from the 18 months to yeah to four years of age. Again, as Nick said, that was just to um, facilitate the, the extra vaccine at a national schedule for, oh, sorry, in that national program to include the meningococcal B vaccine. <coughs> so in summary tonight, I, I hope that I've shown, you know, despite um, the successes of the programs, with in FA, um, you know, that there are still quite a few um, disparities in a number of vaccine preventable diseases. Vaccine coverage is, is pretty good. And in fact, you know, our latest coverage shows that the immunisation coverage for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children um, to be at record levels across all ages. However, the, the delay in immunisation and vaccine preventable diseases still remains a significant health issue for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children. So this is why we need to really focus on, focus on making sure that all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children, they receive their vaccine in a timely manner. And in finally, uh, and finally in relation to the, the vaccination schedule gap, so you can see that by the previous gap, we have closed the uh, hepatitis A immunisation disparity. But uh, our five to 14 year old age gap for influenza, as well, we've closed that gap. You know, now they're all um, eligible to receive the back, so the annual immunisation, sorry, the annual influenza vaccine. Um, so we're hoping as well. So the two upcoming, so the changes, the upcoming changes to the NIP, we're hoping that will also improve the two diseases with the highest burden for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children. So that meaning the pneumococcal and the meninge B. And 
So what you what what can you do as a service provider? So um, you know, we all really need to make sure that if you know that you're identifying your Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander um, patients, you know, clients or consumers. So you know, to make sure that they're receiving the most culturally appropriate services, um, both like uh, clinical and and culturally responsible as well. So correct identification also helps um helps you as a provider to refer those uh, refer Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander uh, communities on you know to recommend the the correct screening so at a younger age um, as I mentioned referral to um, external services and also um, a lot of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander families as well so we're very transient so it's just as well as being aware of that national immunization schedule because you know the, the schedule it varies it varies as well between states and territories and just to try and you know continue to offer immunization opportunities at all visits to all our families so you know the take-home message it's just include aboriginal and torres strait islander healthcare workers um in your services you know we need Aboriginal healthcare workers, they just need, and healthcare professionals, we need to be at the centre of a program development and delivery as the health gap won't close without full support from your Aboriginal um, healthcare workers' involvement, Aboriginal communities, and just this establish, you know, that ongoing respectful relationship through, through your engagement with communities. And, you know, Indigenous issues, it can be daunting as well, you know, it's easy to slip into that state of uh, helplessness and convince, and convince that nothing that you will do will, will help or you're too scared in case you do some, something wrong. Um, you know, it shouldn't, it should be more about our responsibility as a human being, as, as an Australian as well, to really understand the situation in which Indigenous uh, people find themselves in and, and how you can be in, be an empowering and a positive force in fights for, you know, for the rights for um, the first people of, of this country, you know, just there's so much information out there where we all can be, you know, just continually of learning, like read, like I've just jotted a few points down here. So like read up, like, you know, the Australian Institute of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies and the Australian Institute of Health Bulletin. They have some really, really great um, resources and health resources. And I encourage like everybody as well, just to have a read of um, Bruce Pascoe's uh, Dark Emu. It's, it's, a, um, it's a really good, good read as well. So it, it nudges um, readers to rethink and understand our country before it was called Australia. And then I also just follow like, um, the Indigenous media as well. So follow Indigenous X. It's a um, it's a uh, a platform for um, academics so uh, across Australia to engage in like the recent you know um, activities that are happening all across Australia. Uh, in it. and then you know even just watch NITV. You pick up so much information as well. Just to, I've just jotted these down just to really hopefully try and engage. With, with everybody to really like to take more of a, I suppose, a risk, just education. That's all it really is, is just educate ourselves. And, and if you don't know, just ask your Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander, you know, peak bodies as well within your states and territories. Yep, and so that's about it. So thank you. You know, it always seems impossible and until it's done, but as a great Nelson Mandela says, you know, if we don't do it, but won't be done. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Katrina. Um, you always present so well and uh, so passionately, and I think it's really en enlightening to understand a lot more um, about why these recommendations are being made for uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. Uh, really important and you know I think it's a really great reminder for practices to always 
always ask the question, do you identify yourself or your child as Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander? Because it's just so important that these um, individuals are appropriately vaccinated. Um, we did have one chat coming in, a little question or a little comment that came into the chat box. Um, they were just sort of asking about, you know, providers that perhaps don't follow the schedule for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children and make the assumption that these children are not at risk of hepatitis A, so they don't really need the vaccine. So uh, any advice on how to tackle something like that? Um, well, you know, I've just showed like, yes, the hepatitis A, you know, um, disease rate has gone down, but those recommend recommendations are there and it, we, we should be following the national immunisation schedule for, you know, our most vulnerable. So that's why, you know, we have now that national um, Indigenous uh, schedule for service providers, I suppose, trying to make it, you know, more easier and I suppose accessible for, as I said, our families that are very transient to, <clears throat> around the country. So, you know, it's our responsibility to really, as healthcare professionals, to make sure that our most vulnerable are receiving those funded vaccines. Uh, yes, absolutely, totally agree. And I think we just need to remind providers that we're not there to decide for the patient whether they should or should not receive a vaccine. Um, our job as immunisation providers are, are to follow the schedule, recommend what is on the schedule, and give all of them some benefits to the vaccine and allow people to then make up their own mind to whether they have vaccines or not. Um, it's certainly not the role of the provider to, to make that decision. So thank you very much, Katrina. You and I'd like to welcome you to share your screen. Thank you very much and start your presentation. Thank you very much, Angela. Am I sharing my screen yet? Okay, so thank you very much, Angela, and good evening to everyone. First, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today. And I'd also like to pay my respects to elders past, present, and emerging. So my name is Yuan Lai. I am the medical manager working with Pfizer vaccines. And today I will be talking about the rationale behind the pneumococcal vaccine recommendation changes and the NIP schedule changes. I do realize that parts of my talk will overlap with the previous speakers' talks, but I hope that I will be able to provide additional information on top of what they have very beautifully presented on. But before we go on to talk about pneumococcal vaccines, first, I'd like to give a brief overview of what it takes to list a vaccine on the NIP. In one word, it's a very rigorous process. So of course, the first step is to get TGA registration for the vaccine to be able to be used in Australia. So the TGA will look at clinical trial data that the sponsor of the vaccine submits for registration, and they will determine that the vaccine is safe and effective for use. And then after that is when ATAGI gets involved. So ATAGI is the Australian Technical Advisory Group on Immunisation. So prior to a sponsor submitting a funding uh, submission to the PBAC, the sponsor needs to obtain clinical advice from ATAGI. What ATAGI looks at is ATAGI looks at the evidence, so the clinical evidence for the vaccine's safety and effectiveness, from the perspective of the NIP population or the NIP cohort. ATAGI also looks at the epidemiology and burden of disease for that specific NIP cohort, along with other things such as programmatic aspects of the NIP schedule. So they will look at what, when to give the vaccine and what that vaccine can be co-administered with. So based on clinical advice from the TARDI, the vaccine sponsor will then put in a funding submission 
to the PBAC. So the PBAC is the Pharmaceutical Benefits Advisory Committee. And this is where health economics comes into play. So based on a target advice, the PBAC will look at the effectiveness and the cost of giving the vaccine on the NIP and compare it with alternative options. The green arrows here show that this is not a one-time process. So the PBAC gets the opportunity to go back to Atagi several times throughout the evaluation process to ask for clinical advice. So they can ask specific questions to the Atagi and Atagi will provide their clinical opinion. So the PBAC looks at the cost effectiveness of using a vaccine on the NIP for that population. If the PBIC determines that the vaccine given on the NIP for that population is cost effective, they will then say that they give a positive recommendation. So if this positive PBIC recommendation is obtained, then it progresses on to get the Minister of Health to sign off on it, and then a piece of legislation needs to be amended. Only then can a vaccine be used on the NIP. This is a simplified version. There's several other steps in between, but I'm just showing you the main steps that are involved and where the decision-making processes happen. So I hope this gives you a good overview of what it takes to list a vaccine on the NIP. And here on after, I will be respectfully referring to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as Aboriginal peoples. So, uh, Professor Chris Blythe has very kindly allowed me to use this Venn diagram to explain this uh, for this presentation, and I truly appreciate it. So, looking at the pneumococcal vaccine schedule, we know that these are the groups who are at increased risk of pneumococcal disease. You can be at increased risk purely because of your age, and that's shown in the top two bubbles here. And you can be at increased risk of pneumococcal disease because of other factors, which include if you're an Aboriginal person, if you've got a medical risk condition, or if you've got a behavioral risk factor. So what Hardy did was they performed a comprehensive review of the existing pneumococcal program to see who was still at highest risk and where the burden of disease still remained, with the main aim of making vaccines readily available, more readily available to ensure protection for people who are most at risk of disease, and also to simplify the recommendations. Recall that the routine infant schedule changed in 2018, so the focus of this review is purely on these groups on the right here. So for each group who is at increased risk of pneumococcal disease, a comprehensive review of the data was done to look at what the existing pneumococcal vaccine schedule was, what the uptake rates were, where did the remaining burden of pneumococcal disease lie in these groups? Is it invasive disease or non-invasive disease? What are the incidence rates of disease in these groups of people? And what are the serotypes causing disease in these groups of people? So first I'll talk about the routine older Australian schedule. So recall that pneumococcal disease can manifest itself in several different ways. It can be invasive or it can be non-invasive. In terms of pneumonia for older adults, pneumonia can appear as invasive or non-invasive depending on whether it enters the bloodstream or not. Based on this clinical data, it, this is a retrospective cross-sectional study that was done using administrative data from Australian databases listed here. So based on this study, it shows that the burden of pneumococcal disease in older Australian adults lies in hospitalized pneumonia. So in this blue pyramid here, it is very clear that if you look at the rates of disease in older Australian adults, if you look at IPD or invasive disease, is, it forms just the tip of the iceberg. Most of the burden of pneumococcal disease in this population is in pneumonia, hospitalizations and outpatient GP visits. This green pyramid here looks at healthcare resource use. And you'll see very clearly here that most of the resources used in Australia for the older Australian adults group is in pneumococcal pneumonia hospitalizations. 
this graph on the right here mainly shows the fact that as you increase in your age group, the rates of pneumonia increases as well. So based on this, we know that for older Australian adults, the burden of pneumococcal disease is in pneumonia. This slide shows the capita trial. You may be familiar with this trial because it was done a few years ago. So this is a phase four randomized placebo-controlled trial of 13 valent pneumococcal conjugate vaccines. This is a trial that was done in the Netherlands use, um, of almost 85,000 study subjects aged 65 years and older. This is an efficacy trial. So what that means is that we randomized people into the placebo arm or the 13 valent conjugate vaccine arm. We vaccinate them and then we wait and follow them up to see where the diseases were happening. We count the number of cases of vaccine type pneumococcal community acquired pneumonia and vaccine type invasive pneumococcal disease in each arm. So this trial took a little bit of time to complete. This slide shows a quick summary of the results of that capita trial. So it shows evidence of 13 valent conjugate vaccine efficacy against vaccine type CAP and vaccine type IPD. So you'll see that about 40,000 people received the dose of 13 valent conjugate vaccine in this trial. It showed that the 13 valent conjugate vaccine was 45.6% uh, efficacious against the first episode of vaccine type CAP, and this can be both invasive or non-invasive disease. It also showed 45% efficacy against the first episode of non-bacteremic or non-invasive vaccine type CAP, along with a 75% efficacy against the first episode of vaccine type invasive pneumococcal disease. And this is one of the studies that we submitted to the, um, for the funding submission and evaluation. So this study showed efficacy of 13 valent conjugate vaccine against both vaccine type CAP and vaccine type IPD. So why the change to the routine older Australian schedule showed here in this green arrow? So as Professor Nick Wood said, all healthy non-Indigenous adults aged 70 years and older will now get NIP-funded dose, one dose of 13 valent conjugate vaccine. So why this vaccine? As shown in the previous slides, most of the burden of pneumococcal disease in older adults was in community-acquired pneumonia. And based on the capita trial results, the 13 valent pneumococcal conjugate vaccine showed that it works in preventing both vaccine type CAP and vaccine type invasive pneumococcal disease. So then why is 23 valent polysaccharide vaccine no longer given? It all comes down to incidence of disease in this group and the serotypes causing disease in this group. So in healthy adults, age 70 plus, it was shown in the surveillance data that IPD cases that were caused by serotypes in the 23 valent vaccine, but not in the 13 valent vaccine, were mostly in those with risk conditions, not in the healthy population. So therefore the decision was made to limit the use of 23 valent polysaccharide vaccine to these groups of people with risk conditions. And why is the age moved from 65 to 70? Professor Nick Wood talked about it previously in his um, presentation. It's purely because the rates of disease in the 70 plus year olds were almost twofold higher than those 65 to 69. So in order to align the time point of vaccination with the higher rates of disease. And the other practicality of moving the age was also to align with the existing schedule point of zoster vaccination for this group. This is for the routine older Australian schedule. Moving on to the changes to the schedules for Aboriginal people shown here in this green arrow. So all healthy Aboriginal peoples aged 50 years and older will now receive one dose of 13 valent conjugate vaccine followed by two doses of 23 valent polysaccharide vaccine. Why do they get the vaccine at 50 years of age? 
as Katrina said, the burden of disease in Aboriginal peoples starts at a younger age. And unfortunately, the prevalence of risk conditions is also high in this group of people. So the inclusion of this 13 valent conjugate vaccine is hopefully expected to reduce the burden of both vaccine type CAP and vaccine type invasive pneumococcal disease in Aboriginal peoples. Why do these people still need two doses of 23 valent polysaccharide vaccine? Again, it comes down to incidence of disease and serotypes causing disease in this population. Based on surveillance data, IPD cases caused by 23 non-13 serotypes in this group are still high. Therefore, two doses of the 23-valent polysaccharide vaccine are still recommended after the one dose of 13-valent conjugate vaccine with the primary aim to maximize serotype coverage. So all Aboriginal infants living in these four jurisdictions there is no change to the number of doses for a 13 valent conjugate vaccine. The um, change is where the two doses of 23 valent polysaccharide vaccine are recommended. And it's for the same reason as the above, because the IBD, IPD cases that are caused by 23 non 13 serotypes in this group of infants are still high. Therefore, they need the 23 valent vaccine after the 13 valent conjugate vaccine to maximize serotype coverage. So when we've talked about routine older Australian schedule, we've talked about the Aboriginal people's schedules. Next, we'll talk about the schedule for people who are at risk because they are either at, they either have a medical risk factor or they have a behavioral risk factor that puts them at higher higher risk of pneumococcal disease. So all people with these risk factors aged older than 12 months will now receive one dose of 13 valent conjugate vaccine followed by two doses of 23 valent polysaccharide vaccine. Why the changes? As Professor Nick Wood said, it is to simplify the recommendations. So the same pneumococcal vaccine recommendations and dosing will apply for anyone aged older than 12 months who fall under any of the conditions on the list. Of course, the universe is not perfect. There is a small exception here for stem cell transplant patients who go by a different dosing schedule because they essentially get their immune system reset and so they need a little bit more help with uh, vaccine doses. So simplifying is one big reason. Um, the intent is also to provide fully funded vaccines to many of the very high risk patients who were previously unable to access fully funded pneumococcal vaccines. Unfortunately, NIP funding could not be provided to all groups in the single list because the rates of disease for some of these groups of people were not high enough to be deemed cost effective under the PVAC evaluation criteria. And because of the provision of fully funded vaccines to these very high risk patients, the PBAC considered PBS listing for a 23 valent polysaccharide vaccine was no longer needed. So why do these groups of people still need the two doses of 23 valent polysaccharide vaccine? It is for the same reason as in the previous slide. It's because the IPD cases caused by 23 non-13 serotypes in this population are still high, and therefore the two doses of 23 valent polysaccharide vaccine are recommended after the 13 valent conjugate vaccine, mainly to maximize serotype coverage for this group. So then Professor Nick Wood talked about the complexity of category A and category B conditions and each category having different vaccine recommendations as shown here. After 1st of July, it has now been combined into a single list of risk conditions with everyone who falls under this list receiving the same pneumococcal vaccine recommendations with these exceptions here. So if you look at this table here, the shaded, the shaded parts are where NIP funding is provided. Where it's not shaded, that's where the um, NIP funding is not applicable to them. And 
you know, NIP funding could not be provided to all groups because the rates of disease in some of these groups were not high enough to be deemed cost effective. So there are other several smaller practical reasons for the changes. The aim of the government is to provide more equitable access to pneumococcal vaccines to everyone who is most at risk of disease. And the aim to simplify the vaccine recommendations is to help with implementation, to make it easier to align with existing time points for vaccination, and hopefully to improve adherence to the recommended schedules. So in summary, this is basically what types of vaccines would be recommended for the types of people. So the top two bubbles here are where people are at increased risk of disease purely because of their age. The routine infant schedule changed in 2018. There's no change to that schedule now. They still receive 13 valent conjugate vaccine doses. For the routine older Australian schedule, they will now receive a one dose of 13 valent conjugate vaccine at age 70 plus. For the groups of people who are at risk of disease because of other factors, they will receive the 13 valent conjugate vaccine followed by two lifetime doses of 23 valent polysaccharide vaccine. And this to me looks like it is a very much simplified um, recommendation and schedule. So is this the end, you may ask? Unfortunately, the pneumococcus bug is very smart. Pneumococcal disease epidemiology is constantly changing and will continue to change. We know that the routine infant schedule changed in 2018. We expect to see some of the early impacts of that change soon. Post 1 July, we will need to monitor the impact of these other changes very closely. And depending on how the disease patterns change, how burdens of disease change, the necessary changes will, made as, will be made as needed. So thank you very much for your attention. I hope that was helpful. I hope that was clear. Um, and I will now hand this back to Angela for the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ewan. I think um, you provided a, an excellent overview of something that's actually really very, very complex, and that is that that passage of getting a vaccine um, to a point where it's going to be recommended to be put onto the vaccination schedule. Um, and it is a, it's a long, arduous process, and uh, you've done a really good job of explaining how it gets there. You went on to say um, really clearly the why those recommendations have changed for pneumococcal vaccines and certainly um, backed Nick's presentation up in regards to you know, the, why the government have made those decisions. So um, from uh, you know, the questions in the chat box, there were a few of them that were saying, so if somebody is a young person now and they have a medical condition and they are getting um, pneumococcal vaccines now. They might have a Prevnar 13 now and they go on to have their two doses of Pneumovax 23. Uh, what happens when they get to be 70? What do they receive then? So um, I think we can clearly back you up, Ewan, in saying that immunisation schedules change frequently and I think it's a watch, wait and see. Nick, have you got any further comments on what might happen in the, the future? Oh, look, I think like you and said, um, <clears throat> there, I know there's work underway with next generation pneumococcal vaccines. There's a 20 valent pneumococcal vaccine in the pipeline, conjugate vaccine. There's probably be the Holy Grail, which is the common protein vaccine for pneumococcus, which is, you know, pneumococcus has got about 80 different serotypes. Um, and so they're, they're ultimately, hopefully in the next decades will be the, 
the, the common protein vaccine that deals with all of the different serotypes. Um, so, you know, if you're 30 and you're waiting, what do I do? And I'm 70, 40 years away, there's bound to be a new vaccine by then. Who knows? There might be skin patch vaccines. There's all different te techniques happening. Yes, um, none of us have a crystal ball for sure, but what we uh, certainly do know is that uh, we're, in, we're in a job that's going to continue to be in demand. Um, new vaccines, a very, very exciting future that we've got, and like new um, methods of vaccine delivery, skin patches, so those nan patches that we're talking about, um, yes, oral vaccines where the up on the inside of your cheek, you know, your vaccines are going to be certainly changing in the future. Um, in regard to uh, some of the questions that came to the box, once again, Nick and you, and really it was a room of couple vaccines, you uh, we have had two or three doses of new Mix 23 already in their lifetime, 70, 71 years of age. Uh, do they still get Crevenar 13? And yes, they certainly do still get Crevenar 13, um, and that could be an opportunity as well. Um, Katrina, do you have any last moment comments? I think everyone was quite. Please with your presentation, there are no questions in the box. I think you did a good job in answering all of them. Good. good. Um, just from um, my point of view, um, Ewan, any further last minute comments? Uh, from me? I can't quite hear you, I'm so sorry. Oh, no, no, no. That's pretty much all right. Yeah, thank you very much, though. Um, unfortunately, we have had some sound issues, apparently. this um, My voice is a horrible voice at the best of time, and so this computer is obviously objecting to hear it because it's not allowing a lot of my words to come through. But just so I can um, just outline a couple of other things, there were some questions around um, the minimum intervals between the vaccines, the pneumococcal vaccine, so I'll just highlight those for you. Um, the recommended interval between the last dose of Abrana 13 and the first dose of a Nimavac 23 is 12 months, although a two-month interval is acceptable. The recommended interval between the two doses of Nimavac 23 is five years. If you are administering Prina 13 to a client that has had previously pneumococcal and pneumococcal 23 vaccines, there should be an interval of 12 months. So there certainly are minimum means that should be um, addressed. So I think I'm still having trouble getting my answers. Is that correct? Um, I think what we will do is um, when we hear this recording back, we will certainly um, write down these and write down all of the answers. But um, just otherwise in summary, um, because we in South Australia, um, SA Health Immunisation Section has a mail out coming your way, um, currently underway, is my understanding, that will contain a couple letter summary of the chain, reference to the updated handbook chapters, the multiple ATAGI statements, as well as an updated schedule. The pages on the SA Health website have um, all been updated as well, and they have now added a new page that is titled Medically At Risk Immunisation Requirements.
and that is collated to all those entire documents onto the one page. Your vaccine ordering will be through your normal vaccine ordering um, form. Vaccine, of course, is subject to availability. Um, so keep your eyes open on the VDC site for any updates going forward. They will be updating the principles for vaccine administration at the 12 month schedule point. We source. So this is where X arrow was to be in the left link exclusively as of the 1st of July that is no longer a requirement. So you can serve Xero in any limb um, and it could be co-committed with other vaccines if need be. In regards to, uh, Nick alluded to the numerous smart tool. So the numerous smart tool is a tool that does assist providers to navigate the complexity of pneumococcal vaccination pathways. Um, whilst the pathway potentially is a little um, clearer because we don't have category A, category B, um, it's probably more around getting your head around whether it's a funded vaccine or not a funded vaccine. So the new tool that is hosted on the Immunisation Coalition website is being updated to reflect all of those changes, so it will be a useful tool for providers. So, take the messages. This webinar is recorded, has been recorded. It will be available um, and uploaded onto the Innovation Hub website. And once that has occurred, we will notify all of the providers so you can we watch this webinar if you wish to, or share it with your colleagues that couldn't attend. Just to recap, uh, as you mentioned, it's just so important to check the AIR before you administer any things to ensure that vaccine history is noted. So parents will get what vaccine they have had, Particularly, perhaps if they have purchased a meningococcal B vaccine or a meningococcal TWI or something in the past, um, it's really important to look on that AIR and not just rely on the baby blue book that the parents may well bring in. Um, So we just changed microphones on different computers. So thumbs up if you can hear me better. Yay. Okay, good. So other resources um, that are available to you, of course, are all of those ATAGI sheets. The handbook has been updated. Um, there was going to be a little bit more of an update, I think, to the handbook because the Hemopoietic stem cell transplant table only mentioned one dose of Numivax 23 at 48 months post um, transplant, and they should really get a second dose. That second dose of Numivax 23 um, also um, is my understanding. So the NumeraSmart tool, of course, the immunization calculator, the, there is now the national immunization calculator it is only, once again, for children less than 10 years of age. Um, it is still under development, so it doesn't capture the medically at risk children, it doesn't capture refugee children. So if you are still wanting to work out a catch up for um, a refugee child, for example, just um, go through the process and tick the box that says um, is an Australian resident and then say the next box, yes, they um, have an overseas vaccine history that you're going on, and then the next box that said, yes, they receive vaccines overseas. It's just the only way that you're gonna be able to navigate it for the moment. Um, just the heads up that the catch-up calculator does not accommodate 
meningococcal B vaccine at this time, but certainly the Commonwealth are aware of that. Um, and mainly because the tool has always been based on NIP um, funded vaccines rather than private or state funded vaccines. And the tool was certainly developed way before, or well, the platform was developed way before um, it was Bexero was coming onto the schedule um, as an NIP funded vaccine for our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander bubbies. So they are aware of it and um, that may well be integrated in. Um, there will be some pharmaceutical industry resources that will probably come out as well in regards to the high risk ACWI and meningococcal B um, clients. Um, and you and thumbs up if Pfizer are actually we're developing some resources as well. Um, yes. Thumbs up from you and that uh, yes, they are, which will also help you. Some of the questions in the uh, Q&A box also were around, uh, because there was a shortage of Nimbavax 23, they've all of a sudden now um, got 40 doses of Nimbavax 23 in their fridge that they will no longer be giving to the 65 year olds. So what do they do with all of those doses? So my recommendation would be to search through your practice management software for all individuals over 12 months of age who qualify with those medical conditions um, and are eligible for two doses of Numavax 23. And I think you'll probably find that you've got quite a few patients that have not received their two doses of Numavax 23 and may well have those medical conditions. Um, you know, we just will reiterate again, Katrina, that we must, as providers, ask the question every time to every client to make sure that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people receive the vaccines that are recommended for them. It's just so important. And we are in the process at, um, the immunisation hub of updating our little immunisation fridge magnet for the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children. So that will reflect that shifting of hepatitis A um, to those new scheduling points. Um, continue, like um, Nick was saying, continue to recommend um, paracetamol prior to the Bexero vaccine for those little children less than two years of age, uh, followed by two doses of paracetamol six hours apart and um, post vaccination. Um, there were some comments on the NCIRS webinar um, last week around parents that can't afford to buy paracetamol and how you can navigate that. It is difficult to navigate. Um, if the parents can't afford to buy it, but it might be something to think about in your practices to when a parent actually phones to make the appointment, and it is going to be an appointment where Bexero is given, is to advise the parents at that time that the child should receive this dose prior. And it might just give them a couple of weeks to get some money together to go ahead and purchase a bottle of um, paracetamol. Um, also remembering, of course, if there is no documented evidence of a person receiving these vaccines, then please go ahead and vac vaccinate them. We then assume that they have not received the vaccines if there's been no documentation of them. So going forward now, it would be a great opportunity to recall all of your 70-year-old patients for their Zostavax and their Prevnar 13. Just make sure that if they did have that dose um, of 23-valent vaccine, the Numavax 23, fairly recently, that you do observe those minimum intervals before you give the Prevnar 13. So I'll just have a quick look. There are a few more questions in the chat box. Um, 
if someone over 65 presents and has had three doses of pneumo, do they still require the dose um, of 13 valent? Yes, they do. Is it okay to give Zostavax um, and the Prevnar 13 at 70 years of age at the same time? And yes, it is. Nick is nodding his head beautifully. Very good. Um, understood why changing the schedule point from 65 to 70. Still didn't quite understand why change from 23 valent to 13 valent. Do you mind explaining it again? So either Nick or Ewan, Ewan really, for that. Sure. I suppose it's based on the clinical data that's available for um, both vaccines, and I can speak from the perspective of the 13 valence conjugate vaccine. And it's based on the efficacy trial that was kept up, showing good efficacy against both vaccine type CAP and vaccine type invasive pneumococcal disease. And with the hope that introducing the 13 valent conjugate vaccine for these older people, um, it will help further reduce the burden of both non invasive and invasive pneumococcal disease that are caused by the stereotypes that are contained in the 13 valent conjugate vaccine. Thanks, Ewan. Hopefully, um, yep, yeah, I think that was really quite clear as well. Um, yes, the new smart tool is going to be updated, uh, so it might come offline for a week uh, while they make those changes because it is going to be a new look to the tool as well as what my understanding is. Um, if you're working out catch-ups for children, then yes, you would go to the immunisation calculator rather than um, to the AIR. But you certainly need to look at the AIR um, first to see what vaccines have actually already been um, given to that particular child. People who have got natural immunity against diseases such as chickenpox, are they still required to get vaccinated against that disease? Um, it's not harmful to vaccinate somebody with chickenpox vaccine if they've had um, varicella. Or you can, if you're in a GP practice, um, certainly make it known to the AIR that they have natural immunity and therefore don't require the vaccine. But certainly anybody that has had um, uh, pneumococcal disease previously, then yes, they should receive pneumococcal vaccines most definitely. Um, Uh, just to recap on the Bexero limbs, uh, SA Health, as of the 1st of July, are not requiring providers to administer Bexero in the left limb exclusively. You can use any limb and you can also uh, co-administer another vaccine into that same limb. That's not a problem. Um, is there an upper age limit for the 70 plus year olds to receive Prevnar 13? So can a 99 year old be receiving Prevnar 13? Ewan or Nick? I think yes, go for it. <laughs> Excellent. If I mean, I, you know, I... I'm not sure if it's, if it's, uh, yes is the answer. If you're 99 and you want to have a pneumococcal vaccine, why not? Excellent, yes, I fully agree. I think if you are 99 and doing well, um, absolutely let's protect everybody that we possibly can. Um, so sometimes there is no documentation of a vaccine and it's not updated on air and the patient says that they have had it, should we go ahead and give the vaccine regardless? Um, I think, Nick, you want to comment on that one? Uh, look, I think if it's, if it's not on the register um, and someone says, yes, I had it, but yeah, they, look, they, people get confused about what they've had and what they've not had. So I think it's probably 
uh, unless they say yeah, I had it and, and it, gee whiz, I fell over with anaphylaxis or something, then you might want to go digging around a bit more. But but if, if they can't really remember and uh, I think it's and it's not on the register and there was no adverse event, I think I would be fairly new to give it. Yeah, and that, that would be exactly right, um, Nick. Unless you want to be a real detective and try and find out, you know, which GP it might have been that they went to, you know, 15 years ago, it's just a little bit too difficult. And we, we're pretty safe with our vaccines these days. We can't really over-vaccinate people. We, you know, we can't do them a great deal of harm. Um, so, yes, you would still be um, offering that those doses if there's no documentation for sure. Um, the Bexero schedule, um, Nick, you alluded before that the number of doses really, um, you know, can often depend on the age of the person that uh, receives the doses, um, particularly with ACWY vaccines as well. Um, in South Australia, of course, it is a three-dose schedule if they start their course less than 12 months of age. So they get a dose at, at two months or six weeks and a dose at four months and then a dose at 12 months. So uh, that would be our schedule here. Otherwise, in the high school program, of course, it's just the two doses if um, anybody hasn't had doses under 12 months of age and they are commencing the course after 12 months of age, it's a two dose schedule with two month minimum interval between the doses. Okay. So some of these we, um, so one of, the, one of the questions, Nick, for you probably, if someone has pneumonia at the age of 40, um, they're now 45, should they be on the um, medically at risk schedule and giving them a Prevnar 13 now, followed by the two doses of Pneumovax 23? Uh, so if they just had a single dose of community acquired pneumonia, uh, I say no to that one. So, if it was... So, to giving them a dose now, you know, you can, unless they've got other risk factors. Yeah. Most of the time, pneumonia in the community is, um, you know, viral related. Um, and, and as UN showed in that um, CAPITA study, um, you know, there were 40, about 80,000 participants in it. And I can't remember how many cases of pneumonia there were overall, but um, it, it, it's, you know, it's probably more common to be viral than is to be pneumococcal would be my answer. Okay, so if it was a diagnosed pneumococcal pneumonia previously, then yes, they are the MAR funded vaccine pathway. And yes, minimum intervals. Um, so for somebody who is 70 plus, if they have previously received their 23 valent uh, Pneumovax 23 vaccine, and you are now bringing them in to give them their Prevnar 13, you would be waiting for a 12 month minimum interval to be observed. Okay. So we've just got um, a few more minutes to go. Um, Nick, this question might be for you as well in regards to um, localised reactions following Pneumovax 23, where um, an individual um, has had a, a, localized, a significant localised reaction following a previous dose of Pneumovax 23. Would they still have another dose? Um, yes, it'd be the answer. Yeah, I think you'd probably warn them about it. Um, you want to wait the five-year interval. Um, we, we, we do think perhaps that the longer the time between the doses, you might be a little less likely to get a large injection site reaction. Uh, but I, I think it, it's okay to do it. Um, you might just need to forewarn them that um, a recurrence is possible. 
Um, but, you know, and what they shouldn't do is just keep their arms still, make sure they keep moving it. Otherwise, they end up with a frozen shoulder and then all sorts of trouble after that. Thank you, Nick. Um, one of the questions here is, a premature baby considered medically at risk for an extra Bexero, even if they don't have any ongoing medical problems? Oh, you're on mute, Nick. I just need to pull up the listing. I haven't got it in front of me, and, and yep. I think they're... Uh, um, can I take that one on notice, unless Lauren Dalton's online and she yeah. can answer it for me? <laughs> according, according to the, the table, Nick, um, prematurity doesn't qualify for ACWI or MEN-B vaccines. Yeah, that's what I thought. So yeah. that's why I was just trying to make sure. But um... If the baby was born less than 28 weeks, that's certainly um, medically at risk for pneumococcal, so they would certainly be getting the extra pneumococcal vaccines. Um, and that's only funded if the child is still under five years of age. But if you've got a, an eight-year-old that happens to have been born um, less than 28 weeks that hasn't received their doses, um, it's recommended but it certainly hasn't got the tick for the funded vaccine list. Okay. To Dr. Nicholas, why, why do we get frozen shoulder if we don't move our shoulder around after pneumococcal vaccines? <laughs> We don't want you to get frozen shoulder, but um, basically what we say to people is keep moving it because if you just keep it still because you're worried you're going to get pain, the ligaments and the joint sort of tightens up um, and you then get it, it like with, with advancing age, you need to keep your ligaments moving. And so what you don't want to do is just have it in a sling and keep it still because the ligament will shorten because it's not being used and then you get this frozen shoulder. So you get, get, if you get a sore arm, make sure you keep moving it. Just don't stick it in the sling. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Well, any other questions? Um, we will certainly um, type all of these up. And we will certainly send them to NCIRS to add to any of your Q&A sheets that you might find useful. Um, so we are certainly nearing the end. So I would like to sort of wrap all of this up now. Um, I would really, really like to thank all of our wonderful speakers tonight for sharing your time and your expertise. And your knowledge is so valuable and it's so generous of you to share it with us all tonight. Um, I would certainly like to thank everybody that participated. We've ended up with 137 participants at this stage. So thank you um, very, very much for joining us for this webinar. And I hope that you've found it really informative and useful. And I'm terribly sorry that this um, laptop didn't like my voice and that uh, didn't come through so well, but we'll try and navigate around that. But definitely I would, like to thank um, these wonderful colleagues here at Satmere, um, Barbara and Mel, for giving me a hand tonight because I'm not a very good bus driver and I don't know that I drove the bus very well. So um, it's a big learning curve. But I just want all of the providers to remember that the Immunisation Hub is here to support you every way that we possibly can, but certainly so is the Immunisation section in SA Health. So. If you get a little bit lost trying to navigate all of these um, new changes, we're only a phone call or an email away. So um, thank you very, very much, everybody. I wish you um, a good night and I hope that you all stay very, very safe and very, very well. And Victoria, you keep your COVID cases to yourself. We don't want them here in South Australia, thank you. <laughs> All right, so thank you very much and good night, everyone.